The rapid propagation of the COVID-19 virus has forced global populations to live under extreme conditions of incertitude in all aspects of their lives. HEC Paris Professor of Economics and Decision Sciences, Brian Hill, elucidates the meaning of severe uncertainty and tells us why the coronavirus pandemic is a particularly challenging case for decision makers today. Well, it's widely recognized that COVID-19 brings excessive amounts of uncertainty about the epidemic, about its containment, about the efficacy of various policies, about the reaction of the population, about the economic fundamentals. Opinion pages are bursting with articles motivated by the uncertainty shrouding the economy, the markets, and the future more generally. Even the French president, Emmanuel Macron, in his 13th of April address to the nation, emphasized the partial, changing nature of information and uncertainty facing him, and how that complicates decisions. Now, COVID-19 is far from the first example of a decision involving extreme uncertainty, or as people have come to call it, severe uncertainty, radical uncertainty, deep uncertainty. Other examples of such uncertainties include decisions concerning the economy, politics before the COVID-19, environmental decisions, especially adaptation decisions, and a whole range of others. So what is special about this uncertainty? What is so severe about severe uncertainty? To see it clearly, it's a good idea to start with uncertainty that's not severe. When you toss a coin, you don't know whether it will fall heads or tails. There is some uncertainty. But you do know the probabilities of it coming down heads and the probabilities of it coming down tails. Under the standard story, all uncertainties are like that. All uncertainties are, if you will, glorified coin tosses. They can be fully captured by precise probabilities. This story is very powerful, perhaps more powerful than it seems at first glance. It provides the backbone of dominant approaches to dealing with uncertainty in a range of fields, including economic, sways of statistics, risk analysis, expert communication, uncertainty reporting, decision analysis, and others. But clearly, tough uncertainties, such as the ones we're facing with COVID-19, are not like that. No one would dream of being able to put a precise probability on the success for each possible strategy for exiting from lockdown, or of the GDP next year, or of the future developments in the Eurozone. In fact, if anyone claimed to be able to come up with precise probabilities for any of these, you'd have good reason to treat them with a fair degree of suspicion. The thing that makes severe uncertainty particularly challenging in COVID-19, but also in a range of other decisions, including environmental ones and other economic decisions, is urgency. In the face of severe uncertainty, you might be tempted to wait until we know more, until we've had the chance to gain more knowledge or information. Unfortunately, in most of these cases, by the time we know enough, it might be too late. Take, as an example, the controversy over the United Kingdom's COVID-19 policy. On March the 12th, when there were an estimated five to 10,000 cases, and other countries were either in lockdown or on their way there, The UK government controversially avoided closures and announced that generalised testing would be stopped. This decision could not wait. They had to decide whether to confine or not at that particular point. It had to be taken on the basis of current knowledge and uncertainty about the virus, about how contagious it was, how serious it was, about the capacities of the health service, but also, importantly, about people's reaction to confinement as well as its social and economic consequences. On many of these factors, it would have been ideal to have more information, to know more. The information wasn't there, and the decision needed to be taken. That's an urgent decision in the face of severe uncertainty. So how should we decide when confronted with severe uncertainty? Some researchers, including myself, have woken up to the existence and the importance of severe uncertainty. And for several years, we've been working to build tools for clean, appropriate, rational decision-making tailored to such cases. In a word, the most productive approaches consist in being upfront about how much you don't know and acting with a caution that corresponds to the extent of your ignorance. It takes up the double challenge that severe uncertainty poses in two steps. The first challenge of severe uncertainty is to work out what we do know and how solid that knowledge is. In doing so, we need to avoid two common pitfalls. One is nihilism assuming that because we can't put probabilities or precise values, we don't know anything at all. This throws out much of our hard-earned knowledge just because it can't be put into the appropriate format. The other pitfall is self-deception, 
pretending or assuming that we know more or have more precise knowledge than we in fact do. In response, the proposal is to focus on your confidence in the judgments that you make. So for instance, you can ask for your best guess on a question, but you shouldn't stop there. You should then, crucially, ask how confident you are in that guess. That is, you should ask how much evidence you have for it, how strong that evidence is, how reliable it is, how relevant it is. It might turn out that you're not very confident in that judgment. If so, perhaps that's a, an indication you shouldn't be relying too strongly on it. Then you should ask yourself the opposite question. Not what you would say if you had to give your best guess, but what you would say if you had to say something you were very confident in. That could be something relatively weak. It could be a range or an imprecise judgment. It could be that the evidence available allows very few conclusions to be drawn with high confidence. If that's the case, it's important to be upfront about it. This will often be the situation in difficult decisions. That's one thing that makes them difficult. More generally, you should be thinking not only about what you can say, but about how sure or confident you are in it. If you want to say something with more confidence, the thing you can say will often have to be less precise. If you want to say something with more precision, you will often have to move to lower levels of confidence. In doing so, you're going to get a better idea of what your really solid judgments are, those which you can rely on, and those which are closer get to guesswork. So to go back to the UK example, one concern in the 12th of March decision was confinement fatigue. That after a period of confinement, people will begin ignoring the advice or instructions given. This concern was pushed in particular from members of the uh, behavioral insights team, sometimes called the NUD unit. The evidence behind it came in the form of a handful of experimental and field studies combined with some mathematical modeling. But there was no data on general confinement of whole swathes of the population. Now, usually, for applications of behavioral insights and public policy, one expects stronger evidence, often in the form of randomized controlled trials. And this was clearly lacking. Indeed, even by the admission of the committees involved, it would have been better to have more information and understanding before moving forward. With such a flimsy evidence base, it then it should have it should be or should have been made entirely clear that any conclusions about con confinement fatigue or behavioral factors of this sort could only be drawn with relatively low confidence. That brings us to the second challenge of severe uncertainty, which is to work out how to harness what we know and, importantly, recognize what we don't when it comes to decision-making. Good, responsible, informed, but not self-deceptive decision-making. The key here is to qualify how cautious you are when you act, but how confident you are in the judgments which guide those actions. If you have lots of confidence in a judgment or an assessment, by all means base your decision on it. If not, perhaps you should fall back on weaker, more imprecise judgments of you which you are more sure, especially if the decision is very important. Now, these judgments may be so weak as to not support any option as the best. That just means you don't know enough to categorically justify a single course of action. In such cases, acknowledging this is a crucial first step. In the face of it, it's best to show caution and take an alternative that won't lead to too bad a result no matter which values in the range of which you are sufficiently confident, turns out to be the right one. Basically, this advice amounts to applying precaution when you are not confident enough for the importance of a decision, and choosing boldly when your knowledge permits you to. To get back to the UK confinement decision in mid-March, if the decision was important, as it was, and the behavioural evidence only justified moderate confidence at best, then it was perhaps too slight to be given an important role. To summarize, once you are clear about how confident you are in your judgments, once you recognize how solid your evidence is, you can incorporate that confidence into your decision and know how much caution is appropriate.